Here I've got a special video to share with you. So this is the warm-up problem that I gave to my summer research students in the summer of 2021. And in that summer, we studied orbifolds or invariant subspaces of Heisenberg vertex algebras. But before we could do anything new, we looked at an old problem, which was solved by Don Grice and Nagatomo via a series of papers in 1997 and 1998, which was finding the Z2 orbifold or the Z2 invariant subspace of the rank one Heisenberg vertex algebra. So the two students involved were Noah Carney and Jillian Golda. And in addition, Noah is speaking at the upcoming 2022 joint mathematics meeting on some of our new results. So not on this old result, but some of the new results which are not in this video. So before I give the video over to them, I want to kind of give everyone the basic idea of what's going on here, like in a very, very simple classical case. So the group Z2 acts on the polynomial algebra, just C of X, in other words, polynomials with a single variable, by taking the polynomial and exchanging X for minus X. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. So that means the polynomial X squared plus 3X plus 1 would turn into the polynomial negative X quantity squared, plus 3 times negative x plus 1, which notice some of those negatives disappear because we're squaring them, but some of them don't. So we end up with x squared minus 3x plus 1. The important thing to notice here is that this polynomial and this polynomial are not the same. So we would say that this polynomial is not invariant under this z2 action. So now let's compare that to the polynomial, maybe x to the fourth plus 9x squared. So if we replace all of the x's with minus x here, we end up with the same polynomial. So we've got x to the fourth plus 9x squared again. And that's because the squares, or the minus signs, signs I should say, square out to positive signs. So these are the same. So we would say that this is an invariant polynomial. And it's not too hard to see that all of the invariant polynomials under this action will be exactly the even polynomials. So we could denote that space of invariant polynomials as C adjoin X with a superscript of Z2. That just means that we're looking at all of the polynomials that are invariant under this Z2 action. But like I said, that's just the even polynomials. So we could say that this is just the polynomial ring where our variable is X squared instead of just X. So anything in here has only even powers of X. So when you replace X with minus X, nothing will happen. You'll still get like the same thing because all those minus signs will be squared out. So this is maybe the most basic version of the kind of thing that I did with the students. Let's ramp it up by like one step before I let them take it home. So to ratchet this up one step, we would maybe look at a Z2 action on a two variable polynomial ring. So I'll call those variables X and Y. But the action is exactly the same. So we send X to minus X and we send Y to minus Y. And that action is happening simultaneously. So we can't change X to minus X without changing Y to minus Y. Okay, so let's look at some examples of things that are fixed and not fixed under this action. So if we take X cubed plus XY plus Y squared, we'll see that under this action, some of these guys are fixed and some of them aren't. So this x cubed is not fixed because, of course, we know that minus 1 cubed is minus 1. But x times y is fixed because it'll be minus x times minus y. The minus sign cancels. So we have plus xy. And then finally, this y squared term is also fixed. And then maybe it's not too hard of a leap to see that in this case our invariant polynomial ring, so in other words, C adjoin X, Y, Z2, could be said to be generated by 
x squared, y squared, and xy. What I mean by generated by those three things is that everything in this invariant polynomial ring can be written as a polynomial in these three terms. But let's notice that this generation is not free. There are relations. And in fact, there's one relation here that kind of generates all of the relations, and that's given by the following rule. If we take x squared and we multiply it by y squared, that's the same thing as taking x, y, and squaring it. So you can think about this a couple of different ways. Maybe the most fruitful way is to think that we can use x squared as often as we like, we can use y squared as often as we like, but we only really need to use x times y once. Because if we use x times y twice, we can rewrite it in terms of x squared, y squared. Now, in the end, that means that we can take this invariant ring and write it as the polynomial ring with two variables, x squared and y squared, and then the direct sum of the same polynomial ring in two variables where none of them are constants, but they're all multiples of x times y. Okay, good. So I think maybe given these basic examples, we're ready to jump in to Jillian and Noah's description of maybe their warm-up problem. We're still rolling. Great, let's go. This is mine and Jillian's presentation for H with Z2 acting on it. By Vile's first fundamental theorem of invariant theory, for Z2, we know that this polynomial ring is generated by quadratics Q, M, comma, N, which is equal to X, M, X, N, such that M and N are greater than or equal to zero. The relations for this ring are given by the determinant of this matrix equal to zero. For example, X1, X1, X0, X0 is equal to X1, X0, X0, X1, which is equal to zero. Now this Heisenberg algebra is generated by alpha. It's also equal to the span of all the derivatives of alpha times each other, where m sub j is greater than or equal to zero, which is linearly congruent, which is isomorphic to the polynomial ring. Recall that the operator product expansion of alpha has a second order pole, which we take to be one, and that alpha sub one times alpha is one, and alpha sub n times alpha is zero for n equals zero or n is greater than or equal to two. Applying this derivative operator, we can build the operator product expansion for the nth derivative of alpha and the nth derivative of alpha, which it follows that the nth derivative of alpha k product, the nth derivative of alpha equals the piecewise function negative 1 to the m times m plus n plus 1 factorial for k equals m plus n plus 1 or it's 0 anywhere else. Now we want to find a strong generating set for h with z2 acting on it based on previous mathematical evidence and we want to reduce that strong generating set using derivative operating print operator principles and use different quantum corrections and equations to remove unnecessary generators. After that, we will, want to we will want to note the primary and conformal fields as well as their closed OPE formulas. Since linearly, the Heisenberg algebra is isomorphic to this polynomial ring with this map, the mth partial of alpha maps to xm by proposition lemma 3.1 from a Hilbert theorem for vertex algebras by Andy Linshaw, we know that this Heisenberg algebra with Z2 acting on it is generated by omega m comma n where we define that as the normally ordered product between the partial derivative m with respect to alpha and the partial derivative n alpha. So next we want to prove this. There exists a function hz such that the mth derivative of f of z times the nth derivative of g of z is equal to negative 1 to the n times the m plus n derivative of f of z times g of z plus the partial derivative of h of z. So we start out with our base case where n equals zero, and we find that h of z in this case is actually zero. 
So next we want to suppose the statement is true for some n is greater than or equal to zero and look at the next case, which we have here. We can now apply our induction hypothesis to where we get negative one to the n plus one, the m plus n plus one derivative of f of z times g of z plus the partial derivative of h of z. So from our proof, we know that omega n m, we know that omega m n is equal to negative one to the n times omega m plus n comma zero plus the partial derivative of some lower weighted function. We also know that omega one comma zero equals one half the partial derivative of omega zero zero and that omega three zero is equal to negative one third the partial of omega two zero minus eight over nine, the third derivative of omega zero zero. Thus, we don't need omega one zero or omega three zero. And therefore, the only we only need generators of the form omega n comma zero, where m is greater than or equal to four, as well as the generators omega zero zero and omega two. Now in this polynomial ring, we know that q m comma one, q zero comma zero, minus q m comma zero, q1 comma zero is equal to zero. And very closely related to that is this equation because we defined these q variables in terms of x as such. And thus in the Heisenberg algebra acted upon by Z2, we have this because the Heisenberg algebra is isomorphic to this polynomial ring. However, this equation is not in the form of our generators omega m comma n. So we have to correctly reassociate this relation and we need the corrections, the normally ordered product of the nth partial of alpha with the partial of alpha with another normally ordered product of alpha and alpha minus the normally ordered product of the normally ordered product of the partial m alpha with alpha and the normally ordered product of the partial of alpha with alpha. Via the structure of the Heisenberg algebra, we can find this coefficient for omega m plus three comma zero plus some, the derivative of some lower weighted function where the coefficient is equal to this long number. And from here, we can take m to be one and then two and then three and get omega four comma zero, omega five comma zero and omega six comma zero. And from here, we can find omega m plus three comma zero and conclude that we don't need generators of the form omega m plus three comma zero, where m is greater than or equal to one. In summary, using the fact that h is linearly isomorphic to the polynomial ring, we know hz2 is strongly generated by omega mn, where it's equal to the normally ordered product of the nth derivative of alpha times the nth derivative of alpha. And using derivative structure rules, we know that hz2 can be reduced to the form omega m comma zero. Using subtle quantum corrections, we can remove the need for generators such as omega one zero, omega three zero, omega four zero, and so on. Thus, we can know that HZ2 is strongly generated by omega 0, 0 and omega 2, 0. Now, we can find the primary weight 4 field for this new group, which we'll call J, along with the weight 2 conformal field L, where L is equal to 1 half omega 0, 0, and J is equal to omega 2, 0 minus 1 third the second partial of L minus 8 ninths the normally ordered product of L with itself. And using Mathematica, we can find closed OPEs for both L and J, which are given as follows. We made it this far, thank you for watching. And go subscribe to Michael Penn because the man works incredibly hard to put content out for you guys <laughs> daily. And go subscribe to my YouTube channel as well if you wanna see me play games and stuff like that. Thanks for watching.